I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Here's a check of your first word news. At least six people have died in Santa Barbara, California, as a result of mudslides that were triggered by flooding in the area. They swept multiple homes from their foundations after a powerful storm hit Southern California, which already had been damaged by recent wildfires. Breitbart News has announced that Steve Bannon is stepping down as executive chairman. The former White House chief strategist has been criticized by President Trump since a recently published book quoted disparaging remarks from Bannon about the first family. The State Department says the U.S. is considering whether viral or other types of attacks harmed American diplomatic personnel in Cuba and is investigating unexplained incidents in Havana. A new FBI report says there is no evidence supporting the initial theory of a sonic weapon being used. Pope Francis delivered a message of peace today to the people of Chile and Peru. Ahead of his visit to those nations later this month, the trip is expected to cover issues important to Francis, poverty, migration, and the environment. It'll be the Pope's 22nd foreign visit and the fifth to his home continent. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, this is Bloomberg, and Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang is next. I'm Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, more fallout from the chip flaw spreading through technology. Microsoft says it has a fix, but it may impact performance. Plus, more highlights from our coverage on the ground at CES. In the next hour, you will hear from Carlos Ghosn, CEO of Renault Nissan, and Sony CEO Kazuo Harai. And up, up, and away, an ultra-secret military satellite launched by SpaceX goes missing. How big of a setback is this for SpaceX's ambitious 2018 schedule? First, to our lead. The continued fallout over the microchip security flaw affecting nearly all of the world's devices. Microsoft said fixes for the Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities may significantly slow down servers and personal computers. In a blog post Tuesday, the company suggested slowdowns could be more substantial than Intel previously indicated. Microsoft is also temporarily suspending some updates to Windows operating systems that use chips from AMD that are freezing or not booting up as a result of the fix. Now, last night, at CES, Intel CEO Brian Krasanich tried to assure people that their data would be safe. The security is job number one for Intel and our industry. So the primary focus of our decisions and discussions have been to keep our customers' data safe. As of now, we have not received any information that these exploits have been used to obtain customer data. Joining us now, Bloomberg Tech's Ian King, who covers the chip industry. So, Ian, it sounds like Microsoft and Intel are at odds right now. What is happening? Right. I mean, to start off with, Intel was very much, look, we are the world. We're all in this together. Everything's going to be fine. Just nothing to see here move along. Now we're getting them, as you, we just heard from Brian Krasanich, admitting maybe things are a little bit worse than we'd kind of said they were. And then Microsoft coming out and saying, no, actually, we are kind of finding some problems in certain circumstances. So. Really, the, this industry-wide effort to put a, a, a brave face on it and say there was no problem appears to be fragmenting. So what exactly is Microsoft saying here? That in certain circumstances, um, particularly in servers, it, it appears as though the slowdowns as a result of these remedies that are being put in place are worse than had been previously thought. So, you know, talk about then what exactly this means because, you know, if the fix doesn't work, then what? Yeah. Well, it's a choice, right? You, f you fix it and you're safe, but your computer doesn't work like it should. Or you don't fix it and you're vulnerable, right? So you buy more servers to make up for the performance breakdown. Do you struggle by with a corporate system that doesn't work as well? I mean, there are all of these now ugly you know, alternatives that appear to be out there. We also have an update from ARM. Yep. They're saying 5% of their chips are right. affected. 
Uh, luckily, it's not 100%. Right. Uh, so what does that mean? Yeah, I mean, this is really important because remember, ARM's technology is in every smartphone, your iPhone, your Android phone, whatever, right? M many more chips out there based on ARM technology than actually Intel's technology. They're coming out and saying, look, you know, since 1991, 120 billion chips using our technology are out there. Only about 5% of those are vulnerable to only one of these potential exploits. So they're really saying that this isn't a huge deal. So uh, we now uh, have some headlines crossing the terminal about senators urging the SEC and the Department of Justice to investigate Brian Krasanich's yep. share sale. We yep. talked about this last week. Right. Um, you, you mentioned that it was a planned share sale, yep. but he is now down to the minimum of his Holdings. Correct. I mean, do you, do you expect more to happen here? Right. Well, as we discussed at the time, Intel's stance was: look, this is a regular program. This has been in place for a long time. This is the way that companies do this. However, this problem, as it's blown up, was actually known to Intel before this plan was put in place. People are now looking at this and saying, look, hold on, maybe this kind of a, a regular plan, the excuse that executives always use to sort of in, ensure themselves against this kind of an accusation, maybe that doesn't stand up in this case. And that's what these two senators are saying and, and trying to put pressure on the SEC to go and have a look at this. Um, we also have a headline crossing uh, out of Store Simple Appliances um, saying that they don't expose any exploitable vulnerability related to Intel, mm. uh, related to either of these meltdown or the Spectre issue. Yeah. What does this mean? Yeah, I mean, again, they're, they're just adding to a list of companies that have said, look, no real problem here. I mean, the most prominent amongst those is probably Google. They've said, look, you know, we've patched everything, everything's okay, there's no slowdown. So we're really getting conflicting information here, and really what we have to find out and what we're working on, you know, and I'm sure a lot of other people are working on is finding out what, where really is the truth here and what really is apparent is a lot of people don't actually know yet so we're obviously going to see a lot of so what next I mean what emerge. are you waiting for well that's that's the thing we really need to see all of these patches deployed we really need to see what kind of a material impact that's going to have we're going to see Intel report earnings later this month we're going to see how that impacts are in you know maybe people don't buy their chips maybe people need more of their chips and as a consumer out. should you download the patch or not well th th this has been one of the consistent messages if you're an average PC user if you have a fair fairly modern system, one that you've been bought in the last couple of years, you've really got nothing to worry about. Download the patch, you'll be safer. All right, Ian King, thanks for keeping us honest. Our Bloomberg Tech reporter who covers chips, thanks so much. We are going to continue to follow this story tomorrow. We will be speaking with ARM CEO Simon Seekers live at CES, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And another story we're keeping our eye on this hour, Akamai Technologies is working closely with Morgan Stanley to explore strategic alternatives going forward, including a potential sale. This after the internet performance company was targeted last month by Paul Singer's Elliott Management, which was looking to improve shareholder value. Bloomberg's Scott DeVoe joins us live from Toronto with more. So Scott, there's been pressure on Akamai to explore strategic alternatives. You know, what does this mean? Well, it means obviously that they're going to reach out to some strategic buyers and probably some private equity players to determine whether there is, um, you know, value in a sale. So, you know, talk to us about the position that Akamai is in right now. Well, basically, it, it's 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 kind of an unusual company in that it's been a takeover target, or at least a rumored takeover target, for several years now. Because over the last 20 years, it's it's built out its network of servers all across the globe. I think they're in 130 different countries, and it would be very difficult for any company right now to mimic that kind of uh, network. And because of that, they're they're quite coveted, and there's a potential that there'll be several big players that are interested in competing for this asset. Who might those players be? Well, if you, just off the top of my head, I mean, obviously Microsoft, Oracle, Google, and then maybe even potentially AT&T AT and, and Verizon. As we were discussing with Ian King, you know, all, all of these uh, servers around the world impacted by this chip flaw, do you think that'll impact a potential deal here? No, I think the real value here is the real estate that uh, that they have. As I said, I mean, these look the locations of their service servers are going to be it's going to be very difficult to mimic because these are at places like universities and what have you, and it'd be very difficult for any company to build a network like this. So you know, obviously there's a, there's an issue today, but um, in, in a few months, obviously this is going to have no impact whatsoever on them. All right, Scott DeVoe reporting for us from our Toronto bureau. Scott, thanks so much for that update.
Well, venture capital funding in the U.S. has hit its highest level since the dot-com era to the tune of $84 billion in more than 8,000 companies last year. This according to research firm PitchBook. The last time this much money poured into Silicon Valley, well, that would be during the dot-com era of the early aughts. And China has entered the top five in U.S. patents for the first time ever. Chinese investors received 11,241 U.S. patents last year, a 28 percent increase over the same period in 2016. This according to a report by IFI Claims Patent Services. China ranks behind the U.S., Japan, Korea and Germany overall. Coming up, we will bring you our conversations from CES in Las Vegas. Carlos Ghosn, CEO of Renault Nissan, joins us next to talk about the future of automotives from ride sharing to electric cars. And also from CES, we asked Sony's CEO if the entertainment giant plans to sell its TV or movie studios. More highlights later in the show. This is Bloomberg. For now, uh, the strategy is really, as I said before, to uh, shore up our motion picture business um, and then uh, make sure that with uh, any of the deals that we, we may consider in the future, that we're in the driver's seat um, and uh, you know, not in a situation where you know, we have to give up control of uh, the assets that we've grown over the years. Apple is facing a French criminal probe on whether the company deliberately slowed battery performance on older iPhones. This follows allegations from consumer groups. A preliminary investigation began against the company last week for programmed obsolescence and deceit. Apple recently issued an apology for a software tweak that slowed performance in the iPhone 6 and is replacing batteries at a discount. Let's turn now to our coverage from CES, where the future of the automotive industry has been a huge focus, and the Renault-Nissan-Mitsubishi alliance just announced a new venture capital fund with plans to invest a billion dollars over the next five years. Chairman and CEO Carlos Ghosn joined us from CES in Las Vegas to talk about the new fund. Take a listen. You know, we have so many things to do for the next six years, which is about the transformation of the car. And I don't think we can do it alone. I think we're going to need a lot of uh, innovation and creativity coming from startups or also support coming from partners. And we think that the way we are organized today is not sufficient. That's why we came with a new organization, additional organization, which is a corporate venture capital with investments up to $200 million a year. Uh, for the next midterm plan, which adds up to more than one billion, in order to support our effort transforming the car into electric, autonomous, and connected product. VC investing just hit the highest level since the U.S. dot-com boom. Eighty-four billion dollars deployed into startups last year. You know how much competition is there out there to develop and deploy the kind of technology that you are trying to develop? Oh, there, there is a lot of technology out there. That means I'm, uh, you know, I can, I can see it. I'm, I'm receiving a lot of people. I'm hearing a lot of ideas. Now we, we have to be very careful because between there are a lot of very interesting ideas about how much, how many of them are going to survive, how many of them are going to be able to be really implemented, executed at a reasonable price that consumers are willing to pay. This is where the challenge, uh, the challenge is. Now, when we're talking about one billion dollars over the midterm plan, let's not forget that that the Alliance will be investing $50 billion for all the technological development. So $1 billion over $50 billion is about 2 or 3% of our overall effort, which put it in its context. So will you really, really be reading people's brains and uh, you know, using that to help them drive their cars? Yeah, well, you know, this is, I think, an illustration about the fact that this is not only about autonomous driving, which means that the driver drive whenever he wants, he can let the car drive for him whenever he wants, but also that the car is going to help the driver be a better driver. That's what we call enhanced driving. So what we want is on top of the autonomous drive, add what we call enhanced driving experience, where the car helps the driver be a better driver, avoid risk, be much safer, and optimize the driving experience. That's what we're talking about. So uh, what do you think will have fully autonomous cars on the road and how will people use them? Oh, I think it's going to be down the road within the next 
four years. I'm talking about mass marketing here. I'm not talking about having prototypes ready for use because we already have prototypes working very well. Uh, it may take three to four years before the regulation allows this to be mass marketed before we make sure that the system is totally robust in any conditions. So I would say 2021, 2022. Wow, that's soon. So how do you see U.S. tax reform impacting auto demand? Do you think there will be a shift towards the luxury segment? Oh, I, I think uh, this obviously support activity and support spending and support consumption, which means that uh, I think this is going to be good for the auto industry in general. And the fact particularly that uh, the support and the incentives for zero emission cars have been maintained is also a very good news for the development of the electric cars. So I'm, I'm seeing it very positively as a business person. What are you hearing out of NAFTA negotiations? Um, do you think that there can be a deal that won't raise the price of cars significantly? You know, it's very difficult to predict. Uh, I think uh, in this uh, field, we have to be prudent, watch carefully what's going on, uh, try as much as possible, give the different policy makers uh, data and facts in order for them to make the best decision for their own country, whatever we're talking about, obviously the United States, but also about Mexico. That's what car makers can do, just make sure that uh, the revision of the policy is the be in the best interest of the different parties. Uh, Business Week once wrote a story that if Davos were a person, it would be Carlos Ghosn. Uh, president Trump has now announced that he'll be attending Davos. What do you make of the president attending this decidedly global event, um, preaching America first? No, I, th I think it was going to be extremely interesting. I think Davos is first a place where many people meet to discuss about important subjects that matter for countries and that matter for people. And uh, the more people participate, particularly people with high power level, the more interesting it is and the more it gives meaning to Davos. So I, I welcome this opportunity to hear from the, now, from the president in Davos. Your term as the head of the alliance ends in June. There are reports you'll stay on as chairman. What can you tell us about the succession plan? What kind of person might replace you and what your plans are? Look, uh, I, I don't think we are yet there, but everything will be announced in time. And uh, we, there will be a lot of continuity when it comes to driving the alliance and driving the three companies together. Okay, so last question. Nissan narrowed its gap with Honda to 50,000 cars. Can you catch them in 2018 and how? No, I don't think we are at a race, you know, uh, at this level. I think we are more in a long-term strategy where it consists to bring the best car possible on the market and let the market decide exactly who deserves what. Uh, I think the alliance today between the three car manufacturer is at the top level of the industry. Uh, we're going to have ups and downs like everybody else, but we have without any doubt a strategy which is an offensive strategy and the growth strategy. Just some of my conversation there earlier with Renault Nissan chair and CEO Carlos Ghosn. Coming up, SpaceX is not off to a hot start in 2018. How a missing military satellite could impact future launches for the company next. This is Bloomberg. Now a story that's out of this world, a Japanese astronaut who is living on the International Space Station says he's grown three and a half inches since arriving there just over three weeks ago. The growth spurt is causing concerns that the astronaut may not fit into the seat of the vehicle that's supposed to bring him home in June. We should say it's normal for astronauts to grow while in space due to the absence of gravity, allowing the vertebrae in their spines to spread apart. Well, a classified military satellite that SpaceX launched on Sunday is missing. A portion of the Falcon 9 rocket that was connected to the satellite may have never made it into orbit. Elon Musk's company denies it was at fault, saying the rocket it launched did everything right. 
The setback, though, could jeopardize high-value defense contract launches in the future. Joining us now from New York, our Bloomberg Business Week reporter, Max Chafkin. So, Max, what exactly went wrong here? Well, we, we don't know exactly what went wrong, uh, partly because, as you said, it's, it's a spy satellite, and so the details have been extremely sketchy. Uh, what, we, what we think happened um, is that the satellite failed to reach orbit. Um, and, and what some are speculating is that there may have been some problem with the way it detached. Uh, SpaceX came out this morning with a very strong statement saying that their rocket, the Falcon 9, which is their kind of bread and butter, it's the main, the main rocket they have right now, uh, performed perfectly. So that suggests that, that maybe there was some sort of malfunction with the little device that is basically used to attach the rocket to uh, this satellite. But again, it's, it's, it's all very uh, sketchy and, and unclear because it's, it's uh, classified and, and, and the government, and we, uh, we should probably also be aware of the possibility that it, you know, maybe the satellite's up there and this is all just a smokescreen. But, but the important thing uh, here is that, uh, that SpaceX is, is, is basically saying we're going full speed ahead. And and, and that, you know, comes in contrast with how they've responded to previous uh, accidents when their rockets have exploded, you know, on the launch pad or broken up uh, on liftoff. They have often been, you know, pretty upfront. Elon Musk has, you know, made statements, apologized, said he wanted to get to the bottom of this. And so far, all we've heard from SpaceX is them saying, you know, we've done everything right, full speed ahead. Um, you know, if, if there, you should talk to the government if, if, if you have questions about the satellite. Right. So this satellite was built by Northrop Grumman. The customer was the United States government. What do we believe it was intended to do up uh, in space? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure on the details there, and, and, I, and I'm not sure anybody is. I, I, it's, as I understand, it's a spy satellite. Um, this is a, a, a line of business that Tesla has been trying to get into. Um, uh, it, it, you know, if if there it were found that there was some kind of screw up on their part, that would that would have implications for their business. But but uh, you know, th they have been hoping to do many more of these launches. You know, next year and in the coming years. Obviously, uh, U.S. government. You know, including the you know intelligence agencies are big potential customers for them as well as for the other aerospace companies. Northrop Grumman has said publicly only that it's a classified mission. They can't comment on classified missions. But what does this mean for SpaceX and their very ambitious launch schedule that they have for 2018? So, you know, I think what it means is that as long as they don't have any additional problems, another, as long as no more rockets blow up this year, they'll probably be able to sort of get past this and be right on track. That said, there is, you know, this is a business where I think perception matters. And so, you know, right now they're, they're trying to, to sort of keep a, a brave face and say, you know, we did everything right. That said, again, like if something else goes wrong, if there's some other reason uh, to doubt their, you know, their capability, then I think, you know, it could be a different ballgame. But for now, I, I'm not sure that this is going to change anything. They're, they're planning this big launch, uh, Falcon Heavy. It's their next generation rocket. Um, you know, they're saying that's that's going to going to move right on schedule. So so maybe the upshot is nothing. Um, but again, right. any kind of accident is problematic for a company like this. All right. Detective Max Chapkin on the case. Let us know if you solve this mystery. Max Chapkin at Bloomberg Business Week. Coming up, how do you build the Goldman Sachs of cryptocurrencies? We'll talk about that next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Here's a check of your first word news. California Senator Dianne Feinstein has released a transcript from a Senate Judiciary Committee interview with the co-founder of Fusion GPS. That's the firm that commissioned a dossier containing allegations about President Trump's ties to Russia. Glenn Simpson told the Senate panel previously that the file contains valid information and that its author had briefed the FBI on its findings. At the White House today, Today, President Trump discussed immigration reform with lawmakers from both parties. The president reiterated his call for a border wall, but also referenced so-called dreamers, the thousands of young people brought to the U.S. as children who are now living here illegally. The president wants a bipartisan compromise to avoid a government shutdown calling for, quote, a bill of love. Former Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpio has announced he plans to run for the U.S. Senate by the seat that's now held by Jeff Flake. The 85-year-old Arpaio is a Republican and a close ally of President Trump. Arpaio tweeted today he is seeking the post to support President Trump's agenda, quote, in his mission to make America great again. 
Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg just after 5.30 p.m. here in Washington, 6.30 in the morning in Hong Kong. We are joined by Bloomberg's David Inglés with a look at the markets. David, good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, Lisa, well, it's hump day, and that's going to take on uh, perhaps another uh, sort of meaning today when you look at markets, because we are sort of grappling with an added complication at the moment of, of the spike in oil prices, what that's doing to, 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 to broader inflation expectations. Dollars up, yields are up uh, in the Asia Pacific. Keep in mind, we might just see gains early, but that being said, there's also some concern that a lot of these markets in the Asia Pacific might be a little bit overextended. Hang Seng, for example, here in Hong Kong, is on its longest winning streak this century, going back to 1999. Now, a few data points uh, just to note in the Asia Pacific this Wednesday. We have inflation coming through uh, out of China. We have trade numbers coming out of the Philippines as well. We're also watching a lot uh, of these key currencies in the Asia Pacific, specifically the Chinese renminbi. There's some confusion right now in the treatment from the PBOC on the fixing and this, what they call this counter cyclical factor. Of course, the fixing will be very much in focus. 15 minutes before the cash market opens up on the Chinese mainland. That's a wrap of your markets early this Wednesday. I'm David Inglis here in Hong Kong. More from Bloomberg Technology next. I'm Emily Chang. Back to our top stories of the hour. Microsoft says fixes for the security flaws in its Intel chips could slow down some servers and PCs. The statement suggests the slowdowns could be more substantial than Intel previously indicated. On January 3rd, Intel confirmed its chips were vulnerable to hacking. Intel's chips are used in more than 90% of laptops and 88% of desktops. Another story we are watching, Akamai Technologies is exploring strategic alternatives, including a potential sale. According to people familiar with the matter, the internet performance company is under pressure from Paul Singer's Elliott Management. The activist investor had said it would seek talks with the company to improve shareholder value. Akamai is working with Morgan Stanley as an advisor. Well, one of Bitcoin's most outspoken champions plans to build the, quote, Goldman Sachs of crypto. Wall Street trader Michael Novogratz says he'll start a merchant bank dedicated to cryptocurrencies and blockchain ventures. Bloomberg's editor-at-large, Eric Schatzker, broke this news. He joins us now here in San Francisco. And our other editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, is in New York. You've swapped Dueling editor-at-larges. We have. We have. <laughs> Imagine. Two editor-at-larges. Um, large S. Eric, you broke. Corey's shoes, by the way, are far too large for me to fill. <laughs> There's some um, land around there uh, if you need, Eric. You're too humble. Okay. Um, um, what do we know, Eric, about Novogratz's plans? Well, we know plenty because he has had to detail some of them. It's a complicated series of transactions. First, his firm, which he's just created, Galaxy Digital LP, is going to buy a Canadian startup called First Coin Capital. Then it's going to do a reverse takeover of a Canadian shell company. And then it's going to use that entity to raise $200 million in a private placement. And finally, because it has that listed shell, it's going to start trading in Toronto on the TSX Venture Exchange. So this will be the first of its kind, a publicly traded merchant bank specializing in cryptocurrencies and blockchain ventures. It all sounds very highly orchestrated. Is this something that he can really pull off? He's been working on it for months. Whether he can pull it off is something we're going to have to see. It does, to a degree, depend on the enthusiasm for Bitcoin. It depends, to a degree, on how much investors, how much confidence investors have in Mike Novogratz. We know he had a record as a macro trader, and for many years at Goldman Sachs and at Fortress, he was very successful. And then in the final two years at Fortress, 2013, 14, and into 15, the macro fund that he was running lost a ton of money and it had to be liquidated. So that wasn't a particularly good endpoint for him at Fortress, but he does have a reputation and he's been a very savvy investor in cryptocurrencies. And furthermore, don't you just love this idea, the Goldman Sachs of crypto? What Goldman as a name conjures up, what we already know about crypto, put them together, what have you got? 
Certainly sounds good, Corey. You know, <laughs> what do you make of this, especially given that Mike Novogratz shelved plans for a crypto hedge fund a month ago? Uh, merchant banking is a clever idea when it comes to uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. But I think what we're really seeing is the ideas of the things that you can do with cryptocurrencies are, are, are splitting into all of these notions of ICOs. Uh, that's, that are very, some of them are very odd. Some of them are frankly ridiculous. The idea that companies need lending on a small term basis for cryptocurrencies to start to turn a profit uh, is an interesting idea. It suggests that he believes there's a business model that might generate free cash flow for small business businesses where they wouldn't need to go all the way through to doing an IPO to try to raise money in the public markets, even as he's using the public markets to raise money to do that kind of thing. Meantime, Eric, Jamie Dimon has now said he regrets calling Bitcoin a fraud. And this, that's after where, this comment has been repeated and repeated and repeated by us and others. That's where he and Mike Novogratz would agree, because what Dimon also said is that blockchain is real. Mm -hmm. And Novogratz's enthusiasm for this business is born of more than just the fact that he's made a ton of money buying and selling cryptocurrencies. He too believes that blockchain, this, the underlying code to all cryptocurrencies, has the power to transform finance, to reshape it in a way not unlike what the internet did for communications. Now, of course, that's kind of dreamy, but that's sort of what Diamond is getting at. And it's the reason that all of the other bank CEOs are taking a good hard look at blockchain and why they also realize that they can't ignore the Bitcoin futures market. Now, let's be clear. One thing that people may get confused with, the merchant bank is not in and of itself going to be crypto. He's not doing an ICO. There's going to be no token here. He is building a fee business on the one hand. It's going to do advisory work. It's going to do asset management. It's going to build some beta products, and it's going to have a VC fund. It's also going to trade cryptocurrencies, like the hedge fund would have, but there will be no hedge fund there. And it's also going to do principal investing. In other words, put its own money into ICOs. But it is not in and of itself going to be crypto. Meantime, Corey, we seem to be in the middle of the perfect storm of exuberance and regulation, and now we have the Fort Worth branch of the SEC cracking jokes on Twitter about blockchain, uh, tweeting today, we're contemplating adding blockchain to our name, so we'll increase our followers by 70,000%. Jokes are all right, but is, now, is this something to joke about? I at love comedy. I'm a big fan <laughs> of jokes. I think we should appreciate our lives with levity and joy at all times. But the job of the SEC is to protect investors from the worst that capitalism and the markets have to offer. What we've seen from the SEC is they've halted exactly one of these stocks that we've been talking about now for weeks. That's a UBI blockchain, a company that I wrote about for Bloomberg News, perhaps in response to that story because it was getting attention. It was the second largest of those companies, briefly achieving a $3 billion market cap. The SEC has stopped, stopped in and stopped trading on that stock, that one stock. So right now the tally is one to one, one joke, and one enforcement action, or at least in a halt in trading here. I think the tally should be 100 jokes and a lot more uh, work in terms of administering to a fair and orderly market here. And we haven't seen a lot of activity from the SEC yet in these names. They should be careful in using their enforcement power to be sure. But the SEC is needed to protect investors from people who would prey on them and take their money away from them. Not saying that all of that's what UBI blockchain, the internet, or others are doing. But someone out there is certainly preying on investors. And the SEC has not taken any action on any other companies in the Bitcoin universe. And yet the notion of, of a tweet just sort of sticks in the craw because they haven't done much besides tweet. I, I said Eric is dying to jump in here. Well, I, I do want to point out that it's not like the SEC isn't paying attention. The SEC came out with a statement last week right. alerting investors to the risks of cryptocurrency investments, telling the market that it is vigilant, that it is pursuing potential uh, enforcement action, and making people, reminding people that this is as much as anything we've ever seen, Corey, a buyer beware kind of market. Even if the SEC finds fraud and pursues it to its very end, the agency right. wanted us all to know that there may be no money left at the end of the day. So but that's it's true one of thing all for time. the SEC. That's not what their to, job to, is. Their job is to do more than that, right? Not just Well, their put job out is investor protection is one yes. of their jobs. Yeah. And promoting efficient and competitive capital markets sure. is another one of their jobs. And that's one of the reasons that regulators have up until now taken this kind of hands-off attitude toward the cryptocurrency market because 
they themselves are trying to find out what kind of market it really is. All right, buyer beware indeed. You've sufficiently filled Corey Johnson's large shoes today. Thank you. <laughs> Our editor so sure at large is Eric Schatzker and Corey Johnson. Still ahead, Sony has had some big moments at the box office this year thanks to smashes like Spider-Man and Jumanji, but the CEO says the company isn't stopping there. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Fitbit wants to make sure your kids are healthy and active. And so the fitness tracking device maker is said to be making a smartwatch for kids. This according to people familiar with the matter. Not known how the new devices will differ from existing Fitbit products. Research from Gartner estimates that 30% of total smartwatch shipments in 2021 will be devices aimed at children aged 2 to 13 years old. And while Disney makes shockwaves in the entertainment M&A landscape, Sony isn't content to just sit back and watch. We spoke with Sony CEO Kazuo Hirai at CES earlier, where he told us that Sony wants to be a buyer in the media consolidation wave. So naturally, we asked just who they might be targeting. Take a listen. It's really premature to uh, start naming names at this point. As I said, the strategy right now is really to make sure that we uh, really have a very strong operation first and foremost uh, before we start looking at, uh, you know, options. I mean, you know, as these discussions come up, we will enter into them, but uh, it's, it's with the idea to make sure that the, the first priority is really to make sure we show up our own studio. So let's talk about the broader strategy then. Would that involve better IP, better distribution, better tie-ups in Asia, a focus on more niche movies, for example? Uh, I think you hit some great points. I think the, the first thing that we really need to do is uh, look at you know, the IP library that we have, uh, Spider-Man obviously being one of the greatest IPs. We have a lot of other IPs, Jumanji for example, uh, which is also uh, something of a revival for us. Uh, and uh, make sure that uh, you know, we go back into our library um, and, uh, and take advantage of the IP library that we have. I think that there's also a lot of potential for uh, tapping into our video game IP for first party software that we have through uh, Sony Interactive Entertainment. <laughs> and those discussions are ongoing as well. Um, and it's also making sure that, uh, you know, we have the right kind of financing, uh, financial arrangements as we go into uh, motion picture production uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, we have the, uh, the appropriate, uh, you know, producer fees and, uh, and make sure that we also control production costs, which is another area that we need to focus on a lot more. Now, you guys are a stakeholder in Spotify. I'm curious, what do you think of their plans to list directly? And does Sony have any intention of selling shares? Uh, at this point, uh, we have not made any determinations uh, in that regard. And obviously, uh, you know, it's Spotify's decision to, uh, to go into the public market. Uh, and I think that over time, it'll give them uh, more ability to really uh, you know, make more investments in, in growing their business going forward. The music landscape is shifting dramatically. Curious what your thoughts are on or your expectations are for YouTube's paid music service and how that will impact the record industry at large. I think that uh, with uh, YouTube, Spotify, uh, any of the other online services that we have deals with, both on the recorded music side as well as on the publishing side, is really going to uh, make sure that the music industry, the recorded music industry, continues um, to grow uh, and that we give artists more opportunities to really uh, get their music out to the consumers through these services. Um, so I actually think that uh, the music business is a very uh, important inflection point uh, for further growth. Growth. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we were talking about the decline of physical distribution, but now with streaming and all our online services that are coming online, uh, I think it's a great time to be in the music business. Sony ATV recently made a deal with Facebook. What is the motivation for that deal, and what do you think Facebook's intentions in music are? I think that, uh, you know, with other uh, online players, uh, you know, they are also looking to make music a part of their uh, uh, service that they provide to the customers and uh, you know I think it's a very competitive edge that uh, a lot of the uh, the providers need to have because music is such an integral part to uh, to everything that we do and in terms of how we enjoy content so uh, looking out through 2018 what do you think is the biggest risk to economic growth this year 
Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, from from a Sony perspective, uh, we want to make sure that uh, you know whether it's multilateral or bilateral discussions that happen, uh, you know, uh, between countries and territories, that there is a free flow of content, product, also data as well, uh, as well as people. And uh, you know, every time there is uh, an issue or some uh, you know hindrance, uh, you know, to to stop that free flow, that's going to impact your business in a negative way. So I just want to make sure that you know, uh, in these uh, discussions, the free trade of uh, you know various goods and services is on the forefront of everything that we talk about. So uh, Sony CEOs traditionally uh, have about a six-year tenure. You are coming into your uh, sixth year this year. Curious what your own plans are uh, and, and what your intentions are for this year. You know, I serve at the, the pleasure of, of the board um, and the shareholders. Um, and uh, as you know, we're just completing our uh, second uh, three-year mid-range planning uh, session, going into our third uh, as of April. Um, so we just want to make sure that uh, we plan and execute accordingly. That was our interview with Sony CEO Kaz Harai at CES in Las Vegas. Coming up, how Chinese startup Neo plans to compete with its bigger rivals in the race to capture EV market share. We'll talk to the company CFO next. This is Bloomberg. More news out of the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Amazon's Alexa service will be available in certain Toyota and Lexus vehicles sometime this year. The voice-activated virtual assistant will let drivers and passengers get directions, control entertainment features, and perform other functions in the car via voice command. And now to NEO, the Chinese electric car startup that recently raised more than a billion dollars from investors led by Tencent. Last month, they started vehicle sales just three years after the company was founded, undercutting the price of a rival model from Tesla. Tom McKenzie spoke to Louis Shea, NEO's CFO at the UBS Greater China Conference in Shanghai. Take a listen. We had guided investors in our Series D round late last year. We'd sell 20 to 30,000 cars in nine months this year in China. How much of it is down to having the facilities in place, the factories, the build out? Because we see these concept cars being launched at auto shows, but when it comes to the build, there have been problems. Tesla's faced it. How have you managed to get over that? Um, How, what are the challenges? Our, our plant is up in Hefei and has capacity for 150,000 cars. So we're in the process of tooling it now, putting in all the robots and all the, all the lines assembling it. So I don't think we'll have a, a, as difficult a time with manufacturing as Tesla did. China is the king of manufacturing. So, uh, and they've been manufacturing cars. It, it's a JAC plant, so they've had, uh, the, you know, they know how to manufacture cars. And you're, you're squarely focused on the Chinese market for now, but where are the biggest markets beyond China further down the line for you? Uh, we are targeting to be in the U.S. in 2020, and we will also enter Europe as well as within our strategic plan. And in terms of the infrastructure in China, of course, charging points are very important. What are you seeing in terms of the build out there, uh, in terms of those charging points, in terms of ensuring that the owners of your cars can get point, point A to B smoothly and efficiently? Well, ours are, uh, we're unique. So we have battery swap. So our car can swap out a battery in three minutes. And we'll set up battery swap stations in the 10 cities we enter in this year. And so we'll put up uh, eventually with a target of 1,000 battery swap centers, just like gas stations. The second thing is we have power mobile. So we have trucks that run around with 190 kilowatt batteries in the back and can charge you to 100 kilometers in 10 minutes. So we can just pull up, charge you, you're, you're on your way. And we provide that all that for a monthly, uh, monthly fee. So we, we're, we're really focused on consumer use. We're also tied into the public grid. So you're, you buy the ESA day one, you can plug into 42,000 chargers across the country. Do you see yourselves as the, the Tesla killer here in China? Is that a key competitor? in the Chinese market, particularly as they look to build out a factory here? Well, I don't necessarily think we're a Tesla killer as much as they're only our only competitor in the premium sector. So until 2019 or 2020, there's no other cars in our, in our, in our sector. And Tesla is more than double our price. So with the, with the subsidy from the Chinese government to our, to our owners, we're about one third the price of a Tesla Model X. And in terms of more, broad, more broadly, yeah. the competition, we've seen the likes of Byton unveiling uh, a car, a concept car at the CES show in Vegas. Uh, we've got others that are involved in this space, of course. And then you've got the older uh, manufacturers, the VWs, the Toyotas building out here in China. How competitive is the space? Are we going to see some consolidation? Uh, 
um, you, you probably will not see as much consolidation as you'll see con uh, companies who are funded and then run out of funding. I think the old manufacturers, the traditional manufacturers, have partners in China already today. But I think they don't really plan to have a car until 19 or 20. So we've got a, there is competition coming, but it's not here yet, other than uh, Tesla is really here in a big way. And the batteries are such an important part of this as well. We've seen real progress in developing batteries that, that provide enough power, and you're able to charge your ES8 pretty quickly. Uh, what kind of progress do we expect to see around the technology involved with batteries this year? Uh, I think uh, this year the, you'll see more and more capacity batteries, but I think there's a lot of uh, talk about rapid charging. I mean, it's very, very rapid charging where you can, you can charge a car in, in uh, 15 minutes. Right, versus it takes right now, even with the rapid charger, an hour, hour and a half, you know, f about over an hour. So there's a lot of exciting technologies. Also, the capacities are increasing and the densities are increasing. So our range in our car, we believe the next car coming out, ES6, which is a smaller version of our ES8, same battery pack, 70 kilowatt battery, will be able to go 455 kilometers or 500 kilometers. And it's not long before we get to 600 kilometers. And I think that it will be the demise of the ICE car because then you can go further in an electric car than you can in an ICE car. Electricity is much cheaper than gas. And so I think as people, and people, and electricity doesn't pollute. So I think uh, that that's where we're headed. That was Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie with Louis Shea, NEO's CFO. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We will be live at CES again this Wednesday. You won't want to miss our conversation with U.S. Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow. That is 5 p.m. New York time, 2 in San Francisco. And a reminder, we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at technology. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg.